Hello, everyone. Welcome to Open Line. Good show tonight. We are talking about politics. The midterm elections less than two weeks away. Are we going to have a blue wave, a red wave, no wave at all? And and so we're talking about that. We want to hear from you. But I'm, I'm really excited tonight because we have an expert on polls. So we're going to get into the whole thing of how reliable are polls, how are polls done, and what are the polls showing right now? Happy to have with us Joshua Clinton, Vanderbilt political science professor. Dr. Clinton, thank you for being here. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for being here. All right, so my first question, blue wave, red wave. You take a snapshot of where we are. Yep. What are you thinking it looks like right now? Well, historically, midterm elections are typically a referendum on the president. And so right now, based historically and also kind of based on some of the polling data that you see, I would suspect the Democrats probably pick up some seats in the House, maybe enough to take the majority. The Senate. Who knows, right? I think that's a really tough task right now because you have a lot of Democratic senators running in states that President Trump won, and so they have a very tough road ahead of themselves. So I think that's very much, you know, in you know, up in the air. And it seems like this whole Kavanaugh thing, how much did that energize Republicans? I mean, you said Democrats, or traditionally the party out of power is yep. energized. That would be Democrats in this race. But then you had the whole Kavanaugh thing. There's some other things in the news. How can we, do we get a sense of who is more energized? Well, I think like if you look before the Kavanaugh hearings, you know, the polls were showing that Democrats are much more enthusiastic, right? They could not wait for the election to kind of show their displeasure, right, with the president. And the Republicans, right, and conservatives were like not so, you know, didn't have the same level of enthusiasm. But then the whole Kavanaugh experience and the whole confirmation process kind of really highlighted in some sense like the national level of dysfunction that we have, right, and kind of really galvanized both sides. So the Democrats saw, you know, they were still fired up. The Republicans kind of say, wait a minute, right, this is, you know, our battle as well. And kind of we see how close the Senate was. It comes down to one or two votes. It's about our side versus their side. And so they started to get kind of re-energized because the story wasn't necessarily about the President Trump and kind of what he said or didn't say, but it's kind of like, here's the Supreme Court. Here are issues that we kind of voted for the President in the first place, some of them. And so it kind of really brought home that whole issue. And in general, right, it's, it's kind of of highlights the whole dynamic of the whole midterm election, which is that you know Democrats, by and large, are trying to run on local issues at the at the Senate level, predominantly. But and Republicans are trying to make everything at the national level. And every time you had this national event that kind of highlighted Democrats versus Republicans, right? Chuck Schumer versus Mitch McConnell, right? That's what people got galvanized about, and that's what you know people are all kind of energetic about. And so I think that kind of that whole confirmation battle you know, re-energize the Republicans to, quite, you know, to some extent. I think the Democrats are still all fired up, but I think it's, you know, it's now anyone's ballgame. Now both sides may be fired up. Absolutely. And, and so we don't know what's going to happen. That's right. And so here in Tennessee, we have a fascinating race. Absolutely. We have one of those races that is getting a lot of attention nationally. The New York Times did a poll not that long ago that said Blackburn was up by some 14 points. 14 points, yeah. Over, over Bredesen. Yeah. So the Republican Blackburn over Bredesen by 14 points. Vanderbilt did a poll that said it was like one point or something. It said it was really close. Yeah. So we came out. So, you know, I saw that poll and I was like, that that doesn't seem right to me. Like, there's no way, you know, our, the parties would be spending as much money as they're spending if they thought that Representative Blackburn had a 14-point lead. I mean, you know, no one can turn on the television, right, nowadays without getting bombarded, right, with countless number of political ads. Sometimes, like, three in the same commercial spot. Like, That's it's, right. It's insane that you cannot get away from politics. And so that is not what happens when you have a blowout contest, right? So I think both parties know it's a very close race. So our poll said it was a one-point difference, but, you know, 8% had yet to vote. And so it's... You know, could it be a 10-point lead for Blackburn? Sure. Could it be a 10-point lead for Bredesen? Sure. Right. At, at some level, it all depends on who's going to show up on Election Day. But you know, you see some of these polling, and polling is really, really, really hard. Right. So the New York Times poll, for example, they called more than 20,000 people and only got 500 people to answer the phone. Now, so, see, I'm fascinated by that. So you, you see this poll that says a 14-point lead for one candidate, and you think, that doesn't sound right. So you're able at least to go and look at how this poll was done. Yep. And, and this poll was done how? how? What did they do? So they, you know, so they get a, so they do a kind of a lot of pollsters do, like, so who do, who do contact? And so, you know, you can get and purchase kind of lists of registered voters from the state. 
and from there's the different companies that do that and so we do that as well at kind of the Vanderbilt poll and so you randomly call uh, people from the voter list but of course not everyone is, too, is eager to talk to a pollster <laughs> right uh, and so you have and also when we call you know, you know, when, they, when pollsters call myself, like I should answer the phone because that's what I do for a living, but sometimes I'm eating with my kids or like, I don't want to talk about politics uh, anymore. And so I won't answer the phone. And so it's really, really hard, increasingly hard for people to kind of get people on the phone. And so the people end up answering your phone, your poll, look different than the, than, the, than, the, than the electorate, right? They're more likely to be older, they're more likely to be college educated, and it presents real difficulties because that's not necessarily representative of what the electorate looks like. Mm -hmm. And so, like, if we're doing just a pop, you know, what the state of Tennessee thinks about, then that's a, you know, that's an easier task that we have as a pollster because we don't have the extra burden of trying to predict, well, who's going to vote on election day, right? And that's, no one knows that, right? Like, I know who lives in the state of Tennessee. Like, I know what Tennessee looks like demographically. How many live in the East? How many live in the West? How many have high school educations? How many have college educated? Right? What the age distribution is. And so I can make, you know, by counting some people more and some people less, depending on how likely they are to answer the phone, I can make the people who answer my phone look like, using, you know, statistics and kind of math, look like the state as a whole. But when it comes to pre-election polling, Good luck, right? And you're trying to figure out what is the election going to look like, but you don't know that until like after the election. Right. So every pollster is kind of making an educated guess, and if you got that wrong, like good night, your poll is, is horribly wrong. So I'm amazed they, they called 23,000 people, they got 500 yep. to give a response. And, and one of the criticisms I hear about polling and polls is that they are changed, some say inaccurate, because of the whole notion that people don't answer their phones like they used to. Yeah. Is that surprising? They called 23,000 people, they only had 500 answer. Is that kind of what it takes now to get 500 people? Or how, how, how do you arrive at the sample you take? Well, it's, it's, it does take a lot more calls. And so I think, um, you know, it used to be back in the day, back in the day being like the 80s and, you know, and so, you know, a little bit far along, but, you know, not that far along, that you, when you did a poll, you got like 70 to 80% of people taken, you know, you, so you had a 70 to 80% response rate. You know, that's like of how many people actually exist at the numbers, how many actually pick up the phone and talk to you. Now, like at the Vanderbilt poll, like, you know, we call every single number five times. We have like cell phones, we have landlines, we have call all different hours to try to really kind of maximize our coverage. And even then, like with all the efforts that we do when we hire professional call centers that kind of we're really professionals at this. And so, you know, our response rates like max, max out at like 10%, right? Wow. And so it's still, okay. all right. So like, you know, New York Times at 2% is like not great, but you know, even like if you put down the, the resources to try to do the best that you can, you're still talking about, you know, 10%. 10%. And then the question is that you as a pollster is like, well, how can I make that better, right? How do I fix those problems? And so this is kind of where then, like, so I know my sample is gonna be, you know, it's gonna be too much, to have too many old, old people, too many college educated people, not enough young people, not enough people without a high school degree, you know, and so you, then you have to try to think about, well, how do I, how do I adjust those? Uh, and so then you have to make assumptions about what you think, you know, your electorate's gonna look like or what you think the state's gonna look like and then make, make those adjustments. And so, and that's like super critical and that's something that people don't ever discuss, right? And so, um, I was on part of the national task force that was formed after the 2016 uh, polling experience, shall we say, to try to figure out like, what happened. Like, what you know? Why did people get it so wrong at the state at the state level? Um, you know, nationally, it turns out that the, the national polls were pretty accurate. Actually, most accurate it's ever been at predicting the popular vote. But right. the problem is like, who cares about that, right? <laughs> That's like, you know, you you know, you win the. You know, no, that doesn't matter for anything. Right? Well, and were we, I mean, I'm fascinated that you were part of this group that studied the 2016 election yeah. and the polling. And yes, going into that night, I think, I think most people thought, you know, Hillary Clinton was favored. Those polls, they did show the popular vote. Maybe there wasn't enough attention. Was there a shift at the last minute or was the polling wrong? So there's, so both. Right, uh, so one is that the, you know, so if you think back to 2016, the two candidates that were running were historically unpopular, right, in terms of presidential contests. And in fact, for all the critical states, like if you look at Michigan, you look at Florida, you look at Wisconsin, like all those like really close states that decided it, like 10% of the people didn't decide until like the last week of the election. So polls had like no chance to kind of predict <laughs> those, right? And so, which, you know, raises the question, like when a poll says it's a plus one error and my margin of error is three points, but 10% are undecided, like, 
well, it's not really one, right? It's like plus or minus 10 at least. So, so you had a lot of people changing their minds at the last minute, right? Which is you know something we still see today. Or so in the poll that we did, like 8% are still undecided about the Senate race in Tennessee, and 12% were undecided about the governor race. Okay. Right. And so right. people decide late, right? Sometimes you know about 10%, and you can't predict those because how they go, you know, is how they go. But so that pollsters are off the hook for that in some sense, although maybe they you know, ought to be more cognizant of, of kind of uh, those impacts. But the other thing that they did is they did mess up in terms of how they analyzed their data in, this, in the following sense, in that if you think back to what was a critical issue in 2016, it was ha what happened to um, white voters with less than a college degree, right? So kind of blue collar manufacturing jobs, you know, in the upper Midwest, and you know, uh, just the kind of people who are you know trying to you know, g you know, get by and kind of in, in improve their situations in lots of respects. And it turns out, if you look at a lot of the state polls, that they were not accounting for the different education levels of people who were responding to the poll, which is like. That's the ball game in some sense. So historically, right? So if you looked at 2012, for example, you know, pollsters would talk to too many college people, right, and right. not enough people without a high school education. But both vote, both voted for Democrats. So that kind of evened out. In 2016, though, not didn't happen, right? So the college educated people were all voting for Secretary Clinton. Those with less education were all voting for President Trump. And so if I weren't accounting for the fact that I have too many over, you know, college educated people in my sample, I'm not really giving enough weight to this to this set of individuals who are going to who are supportive of President Trump. And so, for example, the University of New Hampshire did a poll that had Secretary Clinton up by 14 points, right? <laughs> 14 points, which is like a lot. Which is about black, you know, the New York Times said black yeah, print, that's, Blackburn. That's right. right. And on election day, it was a tied race. Wow. Because the University of New Hampshire didn't wait on education. And in fact, when they went back after the fact and they readjusted the data to account for the education level, bam, tied race. Now, that's like scary, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> Not great. And, but you see a similar pattern. So in Michigan, for example, they did the same exercise. Um, the poll shifted you know, from 14 point Clinton win to only a 10 point Clinton win. So that was still off by mm -hmm. 10 points, which right, is right. bigger than the margin of error and not good, right? And so then like, well, what happened there? And this gets back to the, the thing I was talking about earlier that the difficulty of trying to figure out who the electorate is. And so it turned out in 2016, right? So pollsters, what's our best guess about the election's gonna look like? Well, it's what the election looked like last time, which may or may not be true. And it didn't, wasn't true in 2016. And in fact, if the electorate looked like it did in 2012 and 2016, right, Clinton would have won Michigan. But what turned out to be the case is that those counties where President Obama won by more than 65 point, you know, with 65% of the vote or more, the turnout in those counties was less right. in 2016. Whereas those counties where he only won like 35% of the vote, turnout was much up. There were some new people who voted, exactly. right? There were there people was, who voted that didn't hadn't voted before. Exactly. And there was more new people who voted and kind of Republicans and kind of more conservatives and more energized than Democrats. And that changed the dynamics of who was voting. And pollsters right, didn't know that. And so they were making assumptions about who was going to vote. And they got it wrong and bam. Right? That's fascinating. All right, let's go to Wayne. Hello, Wayne. Yeah, good evening. Hi, go right ahead. What's on your mind? Well, first of all, I want to congratulate your family at Channel 5 for winning the Emmy for News Excellence. Well, thank I you. I mean, you it's well-deserved, and I hope it continues for years because it's a family that you can trust and you're very professional. Well, thank you very and much. I appreciate that. Everybody here works I very two, hard. I got two questions. Can, can you tell me when they did the first poll and what election was it? And here's an off the wall question. I saw on this evening news on Channel 5 where Tennessee is ranked 48 in the nation for the hardest place to vote. Can you explain that? Why are we so high on the list of hard places to vote? And interesting, first time a poll was ever done, a little history lesson. So. I'll take the second question first. So okay. when was the first poll done? The, I mean, we think that the, you know people are obsessed with polls in recent history, but it turns out that's not true, right? So you go all the way back to the 1910s, 1920s, um, there was a, a magazine called the Literary Digest, 
it was a, a subscription magazine that they were they were famous for doing polls and so it's 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 fabulous you can go back and find these old newspapers and literally the first page of the newspaper was just like Columns upon columns of numbers reporting like who's going to win in you know in 1920 and and that and that was the big coverage and this became really famous in 1936. So in 1936, the Literary Digest came out. So this was in the midst of the Great Depression, right? They were polling. This was uh, Franklin Roosevelt's first election. They was running against the Republican uh, Langdon, and so it, the. Literary Digest came up with a poll where like Langdon was going to win by 20 points. Like it was just going to be a crushing defeat for Roosevelt, <laughs> and that's why all our history books, right, are talking about President Langdon, right? No, right. not not so much. And so <laughs> they got it horrifically wrong, and and they got it horrifically wrong despite the fact that they talked to more than two million people. Wow. So think about that. They so that's a huge sample size. In 1936, size. and right, and think about who could vote in 1936, and you talked to two million people, and you were off by 20 points in the presidential <laughs> race. Like that's like abysmal. And so, not surprisingly, and probably justifiably so, uh, they went out of business. Uh, they were pulled in front of Congress uh, to kind of oh, testify wow. and, and to kind of justify their themselves and kind of what they were doing because, like, because they were accurate. That was the first they called every single election right in the night, you know, leading up to the 1936 and. And that they got horribly wrong, and they got horribly wrong because how, even though they had two million people take their poll, the people who took their poll were people who were subscribers to their magazine, or people that they got their telephone numbers out of telephone books. And so, if you think about 1936, you know, I wasn't alive there, obviously, but like in the midst of the Great Depression, the people who are subscribing to magazines are not the people who are voting for Roosevelt, right? right. And so it's a vi they're talking to, yes, some people, but the very wrong set of people. At the same time, there's another, there was a new, start new starter, George Gallup, who was doing a poll, and he talked to 200,000 people, which still, from today's standpoint, is like 200,000 people. That's like insane, right. right? But he got it right. And so his idea was that it doesn't matter how many people you talk to, so long as you make sure that you talk to this right number of urban people versus rural people versus men versus what women versus white versus not white. And so he basically tried to parse and figure out and make sure I get enough people of each of the groups to kind of make sure that's representative. Whereas Literary Digest was like, I want every all the data that you have and more data will always, you know, be good. So that's fascinating. And I wanna I wanna ask more about that. But then his other question, then we're gonna go to break and then people call in, please. Yep. Um, why is Tennessee so we saw on the news forty eighth, I think I, we've reported that, forty eighth in the nation, um, some group put that out as far as places that are hard to vote. We certainly have a lower participation rate than a lot of states. But what 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 about those numbers and our participation? I mean, it's it's always a little bit hard to understand uh, what exactly goes in those rankings, right? Kind of yeah. what makes it hard, and how do you compare this state versus, you know? So we have voter IDs, that, you know. So we have, you know, I don't think it's as hard as other states. We it is true that we've had historically, you know, we have we're on the low end of participation, right? Which isn't great, and I'm sure that factors into the the rating that they're that they're doing, and. You know, everyone should participate, but you know the other thing is that you know people like to participate when elections are con contested, and so the fact that we haven't had a really competitive statewide race since 2006, and we have lots of new people, you know, so there's not to p give people off the hook and say that you have an excuse for not getting out there and voting, but like there are kind of structural features, not only in terms of how we do voting, but just the the nature of the elections. I mean, the, the, you know, the governor Haslam defeated a Democrat by the name like literally Charlie Brown, like that. Was <laughs> Like that's it not was. Good. that's it not going to enter victory. Yeah, you know, that's right. So yeah. that's that's not like a race that kind of really energizes um, your no. people to the polls because like what's it matter? Like I know who's gonna yeah who's gonna win. And that's so a good and point. So a competitive race makes a huge difference. And Absolutely. now we have some competitive races. So and now you see lots of people you know showing up and voting early. All right, we're gonna take a break. Uh, we've gone on way too long in the summit, but we're gonna take a break. There. If you want to call in, there's a number six one five seven three seven plus six one five seven three seven seven five eight seven. We'll take a break. Be back right after this.